64,000 is the median number of words per book. Average person reads about 200 words per minute. Simple math will tell us that is one book in 320 minutes. To accomplish this in seven days, numbers say you would have to read for 45 minutes a day. Don't forget to subscribe. Hit that notification button, like, comment, and share. Enjoy. Hello, and happy day. How does slowing down sound to you today? Would you like to reduce the noise for just a bit? Are you ready to make a choice and decide to listen? My name is Igor S.F. Walker. I'm here to remind people to slow down, to reduce the noise, to walk their lives into a natural flow. Welcome back to the Book of the Week series. Every week, as I read another amazing title, I share it with the world. And today we look at Zen in the Art of Archery by Eugen Herigel. In this video, we look at one man's experience with Zen. German professor of philosophy in Tokyo took up the study of archery as a step towards understanding of Zen Buddhism. It is almost impossible to understand Zen by studying it as you would with other intellectual pursuits. The best way to understand Zen is simply to Zen. We discover one has to transcend technique so that the art becomes an artless art growing out of the unconsciousness. Stick around till the end. I will share with you some tools I haven't used that will help you tremendously in this game of life. Discover a way to find out what actually motivates you. What innate human need is driving all of your decisions and your behavior. I will share some tools to improve your self-awareness, social awareness, self-management, and relationship management. By archery, in the traditional sense, which is esteemed as an art and honored as a national heritage, the Japanese do not understand a sport. But strange as this may sound at first, a religious ritual, and consequently by the art of archery, they do not mean the ability of the sportsman, which can be controlled more or less by bodily exercises, but an ability whose origin is to be sought in spiritual exercises, and whose aim consists in hitting a spiritual goal, so that fundamentally the marksman aims at himself and may even succeed in hitting himself. This sounds puzzling, no doubt. The great doctrine of archery tells us archery is still a matter of life and death, to the extent that it is a contest of the archer with himself. And this kind of contest is not a paltry substitute, but the foundation of all contests outwardly directed, for instance, with the bodily opponent. In this contest, the archer with himself is revealed the secret essence of this art, and instruction in it does not suppress anything essential by waving the utilitarian ends to which the practice of nightly contest was put. Japanese masters understand this contest of the archer with himself, and how they describe it, they answer, would sound enigmatic in extreme. For them, the contest consists in the archer aiming at himself, and yet not at himself, in hitting himself, and yet not himself and thus becoming simultaneously the aimer and the aim, the hitter and the hit. Or, to use some expressions which are nearest to the heart of the masters, it is necessary for the archer to become, in spite of himself, an unmoved center. Then comes the supreme and ultimate miracle. 
Art becomes artless. Artless. Shooting becomes not shooting. A shooting without bow and arrow. The teacher becomes a pupil again, the master a beginner, the end a beginning, and the beginning perfection. The artless art are mystical experiences, and accordingly archery can in no circumstances mean accomplishing anything outwardly with bow and arrow, but only inwardly with oneself. Bow and arrow are only a pretext for something that just could as well happen without them. Only the way to a goal, not the goal itself. It only helps for the last decisive leap. Zen is akin to pure introspective mysticism, unless we enter into mystic experiences by direct participation, we remain outside, turn and twist as we may, this law which all genuine mysticism obeys, allows of no exceptions. You had to suffer a shipwreck through your own efforts, before you were ready to seize the life belt someone threw you. Believe me, I know from my own experience that the Master knows you and each of his pupils much better than we know ourselves. Do not think of what you have to do. Do not consider how to carry it out, a master would say. The shot would only go smoothly when it takes the archer himself by surprise. It must be as if the bowstring suddenly cut through the thumb that held it. You mustn't open the right hand on purpose. You must hold the drawn bowstring like a little child holding the proffered finger. It grips it so firmly that one marvels at, uh, marvels at the strength of the tiny fist. And when it lets the finger go, there's not the slightest jerk. Do you know why? Because a child doesn't think. The right shot at the right moment doesn't come because you do not let go of yourself. You do not wait for fulfillment, but brace yourself for failure. This is why you miss. The right art is purposeless, aimless. The more obstinately you try to learn how to shoot the arrow for the sake of hitting the goal, the less you will succeed in the one, and the further the other will recede. What stands in your way is that you have a much too willful will. You think that what you do not do yourself does not happen. You must learn to wait properly. By letting go of yourself, leaving yourself and everything yours behind, you do so decisively that nothing more is left of you but a purposeless tension. So you have to find out if you can become purposeless on purpose. You must collect yourself on your way through life. Focus your mind on what happens in the practice hall of whatever it is you are trying to do. Walk past everything without noticing it, as if there were only one thing in the world that is important and real, and that is what you are about to do. Between these two states of bodily relaxedness on the one hand and spiritual freedom on the other, there's a difference of level which cannot be overcome by breath control alone, but only by withdrawing from all attachments whatsoever, by becoming utterly egoless, so that the soul sunk within itself stands in the plentitude of its nameless origin. The demand that the door of the senses be closed 
is not met by turning energetically away from the sensible world, but rather by a readiness to yield without resistance in order that this actionless activity may be accomplished instinctively, the soul needs an inner hold, and it wins it by concentrating on breathing. The more one concentrates on breathing, the more the external stimuli fade into the background. They sink away in a kind of muffled roar, which one hears with only half an ear at first, and in the end, one finds it no more disturbing than the distant roar of the sea, which one has grown accustomed to, it is no longer perceived. Care has only to be taken that the body is relaxed, whether standing, sitting, or laying. And when one then concentrates on breathing, one soon feels oneself shut in the imperable layers of silence. One only knows and feels that one breathes, and to detach oneself from this feeling and knowing, no fresh decision is required, for the breathing slows down on its own accord, becomes more and more economical in the use of breath, and finally, slipping by degrees, into a blurred monotone, escapes one atten one's attention altogether. This state, in which nothing definite is thought, planned, strived for, desired, or expected, which aims in no particular direction, and yet it knows itself capable alike of the possible in the impossible, so unswerving is its power, this state which is at bottom purposeless and egoless, was called by the Masters truly spiritual. It is in fact charged with spiritual awareness, and is therefore also called right presence of mind. This means that the mind or spirit is present everywhere, because it's nowhere attached to any particular place, and it can remain present, because even when related to this or that object, it doesn't cling to it by reflection, and thus lose its original mobility, like water filling a pond, which is always ready to flow off again. It can work its inexhaustible power because it is free, and be open to everything because it is empty. This state is essentially a primordial state, and its symbol, the empty circle, is not empty of meaning for him who stands within it. Practice, repetition, and repetition of the repeated with ever-increasing intensity are its distinctive features. For long stretches of the way, you must become a pupil again, a beginner, a conqueror, the last and the steepest stretch of the way, undergo new transformations. If you survive its perils, then it is your destiny fulfilled, face to face, you behold the unbroken truth, the truth beyond all truths, the formless origin of origins, the void, which is the all, is absorbed into it, and from it you emerge, reborn. And there you have it, Zen, in the art of archery. Please do help out, it is easy, simply like this video, so more people can enjoy it. Share it too, spread the word, leave a comment and share your thoughts, subscribe to my channel and stay up to date, and the link to this book is in the description below, so buy it and read. Never stop learning, especially learning about yourself and nature, so gift yourself by taking the free human needs test on my website and find out what actually motivates you, what innate human need 
is driving all of your decisions and your behavior. And if you feel you are ready to improve your self-awareness, social awareness, self-management and relationship management even further, do check out my Master of Life Awareness program. The links are in the description below. Thank you. Love and respect.